So yeah, I'm going to talk about uh, theoretical equivalence and duality. And um, so basically, there has been a recent uh, strand of literature on theoretical equivalence uh, by philosophers, and also philosophers working on duality. And these topics have been quite disconnected from each other uh, so far. So I'd like to uh, say something about what they have in common and what things they don't have in common. Um, so that's the, the plan of the talk, so, or the aim of the talk, actually. I would like to, to relate, but also contrast, uh, these two notions of theoretical equivalence and the recent schema for duality that we have uh, worked out with uh, Butterfield. And then I will give two examples of theoretical equivalence, namely different formulations of Maxwell's theory uh, and also electromagnetic uh, duality. So here's the outline of the talk, so it has three parts. First I will introduce the schema for dualities. Then I will try to give a notion of a conception of theoretical equivalence. And then I will go to the examples of Maxwell's theory of electromagnetism. So to give you some background about theoretical equivalence, so these are these two notions, theoretical equivalence and duality, are both taken to be roughly uh, a matter of two theories saying the same thing in different words. So, so therefore it's a natural question to ask how these two notions are related since, since both seem to be saying roughly uh, the same thing about, about theories, that namely that two theoretically equivalent theories or two dual theories same thing, same thing about, uh, in different words. Uh, so this talk I will try to clarify the relation and also differences between theoretical equivalence and duality uh, like I said, this work together with Jeremy Butterfield. Um, and the main point will be to make a clear distinction between, on the one hand, the formal aspects of a theory, and on the other hand, the interpretive aspects. So here is what my main notions will be, and this, kind of this slide is kind of a summary already of, of at least the conceptual part of the talk, not the examples. Um, so duality is, a, is an isomorphism of models of a single theory. So that's it's a, it's a formal notion, uh, pretty simple. Um, theoretical equivalence is isomorphism of modes of a single theory, and in, the, in addition, matching of interpretations, where matching matching of interpretation means uh, that the domains used in the interpretation are isomorphic. And I will say more about that, of course. And then physical equivalence is uh, sameness of interpretation of theoretically equivalent models. Well, by sameness of interpretation, I mean numerical identity of the elements and relations in the domains. So you see that the difference between physical equivalence and theoretical equivalence, that for theoretical equivalence, I demand merely matching of interpretation, so isomorphism of interpretations here, I really ask that the two interpretations uh, be the same. Um, so my main message about physical equivalence is that, is that it's, it's you know, it's, it's a complicated notion and we should be cautious about uh, concluding that two th models are theoretically equivalent, or two theories. Now, about my jargon of theories and models, so normally we say two theories are dual or two theories are equivalent. However, since dualities reveal that what we thought were distinct theories are, come out as being representations of a single theory, so this prompts us to use, uh, to, to lift the use of model and of theory kind of one level up. So what used to be two different theories, now we call them models, because these models are now representations of one, uh, one theory that underlies them. Um, and so uh, in order to make this distinction between formalism and interpretation, um, I, I do that as follows. So I first define a bare theory. What is a bare theory? A bare theory is basically a theory stripped off from its interpretation. So it's a physically interpreted by math but mathematically formulated structure with a set of rules for forming sentences, uh, say an abstract calculus. And more specifically in physics, um, we, we will take, uh, I mean, there are various ways that you might want to formalize a theory, but uh, a, a useful way to do that in physics is to think of a theory as a, as a triple consisting of three items, a state space, 
uh, set of quantities and the dynamics. Um, and this, this, these, um, these three items come usually with, with uh, structures, for example, uh, symmetries. So to give you an example of this, Maxwell's electromagnetic theory in vacuum on R4, so we can, you know, we can formalize it in different ways, but one, diff one way to, uh, one useful way that I will use to formalize this, to writing it as a triple, is to take as the state space uh, the set of uh, smooth two forms, Faraday tensors, uh, which can be, uh, which can be uh, added up. It's a linear space, and we'll also require that they will that they are normalizable, or at least that they go sufficiently fast uh, to uh, zero at, at infinity. Um, just for simplicity, you can, of course, uh, relax that kind of uh, demand. So that's the state space, uh, space of two forms. Now, there are, uh, what are the quantities that you can construct? Uh, so quantities are usually the, du the duals to the two forms, the duals to the state space, for example, um, sorry, by dual I mean not in the sense of duality, but in the usual mathematical sense, I will, I will come back to this. Uh, so one typical quantity that you get is the stress energy tensor, uh, whose components are uh, T mini nu. So it's a quadratic tensor in, in F, so you give me an F, and the T mini nu gives you one of these uh, quantities. And the dynamics is the set of equations, Maxwell's equations, basically df is this, d star f is zero, if we are, we are in vacuum now. Uh, and the symmetries uh, with which the, the state space is endowed is, is, is the set of Lorentz transformations, which map uh, f and t to themselves. So they are. Uh, but he's supposed to be a big t. I, well, I, I made it that small t in order to distinguish it from theory. Capital T stands for theory, so that's... But it is, you mean t, it's, t mini? Yeah, it's t mini. Yeah, okay. so the components of small t are, are capital t mini. That's a bit of, that's notation, oh, yeah, so they just distinguish yeah, 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 yeah. From, from theory, yeah. Okay, um, so that's the formal, <laughs> that's the bare theory. It's, you know, so far, I've used here the word Faraday tensor, but I, and also stress energy tensor, we put them between quotation marks to indicate that so far they are not interpreted. So this Faraday tensor or the, the stress tensor could describe the, you know, the energy of these fields, but it could also describe the dynamics of uh, money and your bank account or, or something like that. So, so far, I haven't stipulated an interpretation of this here. So far, this is just a formal theory with a set of dynamical equations, that, that's, that's it. Now, if I want to say this is really Maxwell's theory, then I have to interpret it. So, uh, but before I do that, let me say something about uh, models. So in addition to theory, we also consider models, which are realizations or mathematical instantiations of bare theory. So models, in my use, are also uninterpreted. So that's slightly different from other usage of, of models in uh, philosophy of physics. Uh, so models are representations of uh, theories in this sense, or instantiations. So that will be my specific no notion of a model, a representation in the mathematical sense of the bare theory. So homomorphism from the bare theory to some other known structure. Think, for example, of how an abstract group can be represented by a set of matrices. Like that. Is it too dark? Or? People falling asleep. Oh, when we do that. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, yeah. What do people? Want? If you'll promise not to fall asleep, I think <laughs> we're okay. 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 So there is for interpretation we have at our disposal the the um, what is called uh, referential semantics, which people like Lewis uh, and Carnap have worked out. I won't really need the the details uh, of that, but. Uh, one advantage of this is that we can th it gives us a framework um, in which realists and constructive empiricists can agree about the interpretation of a theory or a model, so about the basic ontology of, of a theory, from Frazen's words about the picture of the world drawn by the theory. Uh, so, so realists and constructive empiricists can agree about that even though they 
have different degrees of belief in the entities that the ontology of the theory postulates. And indeed, they will have a different conception of what, what a map entails. So basically, for me, uh, an interpretation will be uh, a map. So I will model referential semantics by interpretation maps. Um, so an interpretation will be a set of partial maps. Partial meaning that uh, they, do not to, they do not necessarily uh, map all the elements of the theory. They might be coarse grained. Some, they might not map some of the elements of the theory. They preserve appropriate uh, structure. Uh, and they map the, th the theory uh, to the world. Uh, so the, the interpretation fixes the reference of the terms in the theory, in the, in, the, in the usual way. It maps to a domain of application in the world, which I uh, construe as a, as a set, as a set with elements and relations on them. So that the, these, uh, these in the world, uh, but as such, it also uh, mirrors the relations that, for example, the symmetries that uh, T has. Now, intentional semantics is slightly more specific, so the notion of linguistic meaning, um, which for us in the context of scientific theories is, is what we mean by an interpretation. So linguistic meaning is taken to be ambiguous between what Frege called se sense and what he called reference, usually called now uh, intention and extension. So the in intention is the linguistic meaning of a term, while the extension is a worldly reference of the term re relative to a single possible world. So you could say that intentions are maps to Equivalence classes of worlds, extensions are, um, are um, maps to single worlds with all of the contextual details that are relevant to that, to that world. So we can, we can take both intentions and extensions to be structure preserving maps from, from a bare theory to a model or a domain of application. For simplicity here, I will consider intentions because, just because they are simpler to talk about because, then, uh, because it, intentions abstract from all of the details of the particular world. So for example, uh, in the case of Maxwell's theory, that is our running example, uh, so using the standard electromagnetic interpretation, the Faraday tensor is a coordinate free presentation of a tensor whose components are interpreted as electric and magnetic fields. So therefore, the uh, interpretation map will produce, given the Faraday tensor, it will uh, it will give us a coordinate free specification of an electric and magnetic configuration in vacuum. So the key interpretive parts here are, of course, coordinate free specification and electric and magnetic configurations. Uh, and so we are we are assuming that we already have an established meanings meaning for those terms. For example, as corresponding to certain properties of fields that we are familiar with in our world, such as the polarization of light waves, uh, how they interact with other entities so that we can measure them, and so on. Um, likewise for coordinate free specification. So it summarizes the properties of the fields and the changes of frame of reference. So properties like the electric field is augment augmented in the directions perpendicular to the motion by an amount given by the Lorentz factor. So the Lorentz transformations, which have a straightforward, uh, uh, we take to have a straightforward interpretation in the world, uh, they are summarized in this coordinate free specification in, in, this, in this way. So these, these properties uh, uncontroversially correlate with phenomena in the world. So, the so the, then the phrase coordinate free specification implements the symmetry preserving character of the interpretation map. So Lorentz symmetries of the theory have now a shadow in the domain uh, of the world. The shadow contains the ordinary effect of Lorentz transformations, uh, sorry, Lorentz expansions and contractions of the fields, which are things that we can measure. Now, like I said, this interpretation map is an intention. It applies at any possible world that instantiates electric and magnetic fields whose corresponding Faraday tensor satisfies uh, our definition. So it does not depend on a further specification of the Faraday tensor as being, for example, a collection of traveling waves with certain polarizations, um, because that, that would be a, a further 
specification. So to get, a, to get an extension, we should specify the particular two-form f that we are looking at. So we should give its functional form, uh, which corresponds to such further specifications such as a traveling wave in such and such direction, with polarizations at such and such angles. So for the purpose of my talk, I'm going to slightly simplify and I'm, going to, I'm not going to focus on these kinds of uh, extensions. Seth, I can yeah. ask a quick question at this point. Yeah. Um, just a question about how your use of intention and extension is supposed to align with sense and reference, which I take it you, you, you think it does. Um, what would be the analog in your example of uh, the standard uh, morning star, evening mm -hmm. star example of two different senses which have the same yeah. reference? Yeah, so it could be a certain ele electromagnetic field realized in different experiments. So different experiments realize the same uh, electromagnetic wave, at, at least you know isomorphic waves. So for all the experimental accuracies of the experiment, they are both instantiations uh, of that of that uh, field. Uh, and so the intention doesn't really look at the details of the wave, such as location over here in this experiment or location over there in that experiment. Uh, so uh, yeah, well, the extension does uh, specify such such contextual details. Wait, so your example here would be same intention but two different yeah. extensions. Yeah. Like in the case of the of the morning star, so you have morning star, evening star is the same intention, uh, so the same concept, but they they refer to uh, sorry different concepts, but they refer to different plans. So that's a slightly different uh, right. like use, yeah. but right. it's, it's the same, I mean the definition is the same. So you want me to do it no, no, together, no, no, right? No, no, I would have to same. think about that example for that. I mean how to turn around the example for a minute, but I'm sure it can, can be done. Um, okay, so, uh, so that is uh, basically the, the distinction between the formal framework, the bare theory, and the interpretation. Uh, so now I'm going to say what a duality is, and so I will come into the topic, into our topic of dualities. A duality can be defined as an isomorphism between models of a single bear theory, where the models can be taken to be representations in the mathematical sense of the theory. So we write uh, M1 and M2, so they are both triples, <coughs> so these are two models. Uh, the, so then the isomorphism between M1 and M2 requires that there are corresponding isomorphisms between the, st the, the state spaces and between the quantities. And in addition, uh, like I said, the structures of the state space have to be preserved. So the theory, in, for example, for quantum theories, quantum theories come with, uh, with quantities which have uh, values. So this is how we evaluate the quantities between states. Uh, and so those values should match. So that's the structure that the theory uh, under should preserve under a duality. Uh, and in addition, uh, the duality map should be equivalent for the two triples dynamics. So typically where the dynamics is, is given by, say, an evolution operator. So there is an equivalence condition like this. Okay, so a duality is basically an isomorphism between the state spaces and between the set of quantities such that the dynamics is preserved. So it's a formal notion. Now let's try to get a sense of what is theoretical equivalence. Now, of course, if you read the literature on theoretical equivalence, uh, one of the first things you you realize is that it's a very diverse notion. It's, it's a term of art without a fixed meaning because different authors use it in different ways. But it does, it usually combines two conditions. So there's a, uh, usually some sort of formal or mathematical requirement on the, th on the theory, so there is a formal equivalence between theories, and also some sort of interpretative requirement. Now again, individual authors may stress one asp aspect over the other, or even altogether reject one of the two notions as less, less relevant, say. For example, Coffey proposed an account uh, in which questions of theoretical equivalence reduced to questions of interpretation. And so formal considerations are important also only insofar as they, as they uh, shape interpretive 
judgment. So for coffee, the second aspect is much more important than the, than the first. The first is only kind of a boundary condition for the second. On the other hand, the recent discussion uh, of theoretical equivalence that I'm interested in by Halverson, Barrett and Halverson, Halverson and Semensis, Barrett and Weatherall, has emphasized the formal uh, aspects of equivalent and not, equivalence, not so much the interpretative aspects. So this, this recent, though usually unstated consensus that theoretical equivalence is largely formal, we could qualify it as a quietest position where interpretive equivalent is, is kind of a minimal requirement that is in the background. Uh, the, th the project of theoretical equivalence needs some kind of interpretive requirement, but we are mostly interpreted in, in the formal equivalence. And then, so this literature is basically looking for formal accounts of, of equivalence. Um, and there are different proposals for that. So my account of, of theoretical equivalence attempts to save this position by including an interpretive requirement that is as minimal as, as, minimal as possible. Na namely, it will be mere a matching of interpretations. Sebastian, could you could, sorry, yeah. do you mind going up back up a couple of slides just to the, the one on duality, just to make sure. Mm -hmm. The um, how, what's happened in, the, in moving from a theory to a model here? Because a theory was also written as a triple yeah. like that. Right. So now you have that these triples are representations of that theory, of that other triple. So you, you, take, you take the theory that you start with. Uh, sorry, not that this one that you start with, but the one that you kind of reconstruct. And then these models are representations of that theory. And, and they are the, themselves. Triples. Got it. Sorry, thank you. Yes, you did say that. I see. Okay. So that's my project of theoretical equivalence. It it is uh, largely I, I and I follow these these authors in thinking that it's uh, largely formal matter with a minimal interpretative requirement. Now I will contrast that, and so far this only a you know a piece of uh, language. I, I, will, I will contrast this with what I call physical equivalence, which is the notion that fully takes into account the interpretation. So establishing physical equivalence is, I will, I will argue, that it's not a simple matter because it requires a notion of identity of domains, which may lead us into issues of metaphysics. And, and so the, I think the idea behind what these authors are doing is that we don't want to be too worried about metaphysics while we're doing our project of theoretical equivalence. So I take it that um, that there is uh, there is a significant project of of formal equivalence without the need for all the details of physical equivalent of physical interpretation to be fleshed out while we are doing this this formal project, uh, so that we don't need to to commit to a detailed account of how of exactly how terms in a the theory refer, and so, so I think that such a project is is sensible even if you, one might want to be more ambitious and then later on also study the question of physical equivalence. So then this prompts me to break up the overall project uh, of explicating equivalence into, into two tasks. The first task is explicating theoretical equivalence, which cares minimally about interpretation. The second task is explicating physical equivalence, which takes interpretation fully on board. And I think that this also reflects how physicists talk about equivalence, because physicists are happy to say that, for example, in the, in the case of the Kramers uh, Vanier uh, duality, where a high temperature lattice is, is equivalent, is dual, uh, isomorphic to a low temperature lattice, they're happy to say that these systems are equivalent, or these, these models are equivalent without worrying about the ontological status of, say, temperature under this duality map. So for the physicist, it suffices that two variables that are interpreted as temperatures are mapped one to the other, and that the high values are mapped to, to low values. And even less so do they worry whether, for example, they are realists about uh, temperature under this duality or whether they are empiricists. And I think that's a legitimate, legitimate practice. So that, 
th this practice is what this minimally interpretative approach to equivalence uh, tries to to save. And I think it's it's a widespread and legitimate uh, scientific practice. Okay, so if one endorses this recent concept con consensus that theoretically equivalent models are in some weak sense interpretatively equivalent, but that establishing theoretical equivalence does not require full physical equivalence, then it's clear that we need kind of a we need a, a delicate balance between the two aspects, between the formal and interpretative aspects. So it's crucial not to fill them in, which is uh, what I will do in the next couple of slides. So I will first in the formal condition, and I will do it in the way that you would expect, because I already have a formal condition coming from duality. So I will take the formal condition to be isomorphism of models of a single bare theory. So this was precisely the definition of duality. And I think that it, it's indeed general enough that it covers many of the cases that we're interested in in physics. So what is the proposal for filling in the inter interpretative condition? Uh, so it's what I call matching of interpretations. So two models, M1 and M2, have matching of interpretations when the, range, the ranges of, the, of their interpretation maps are isomorphic, as, as written here. So, so recall that an interpretation was a structure preserving map that maps a model to a domain, and the domain is itself construed as a set with relations on it, uh, so that it, it, it makes sense to consider uh, the corresponding isomorphism between the domains. So we have now not only an isomorphism between the models, but we have what I call an induced duality map between the domains that maps one domain to the other. Um, and so we get the following commutative uh, commuting diagram. We have here the top row, the duality map between the models. We have the interpretation maps to the world, and then we have the induced duality map between the models. Notice that this is a non-trivial, this, this commuting diagram is a, is a non-trivial condition because if these, for example, if these interpretation maps are very partial, then we might get one domain that has less elements than the other domain. So they might have different cardinali cardinalities, in which case this, this induced duality map would not exist. So the requirement that there exists such an isomorphism imposes constraint on the interpretation map. So the interpretation maps have to be kind of uh, sufficiently good in a way. So for the ex take the example of Kramer's Vanier duality icing model with higher or low temperature. These two models are isomorphic at the level of the Hamiltonian and the quantities of the model and the states. Uh, and furthermore, we can master interpretations by everywhere replacing a uh, lattice at, at high temperature with a lattice at low temperature. So the isomorphism between the models induces, induces an isomorphism between the domains uh, of application that takes high temperature to low temperature, vice, vice versa. Um, so this is, this is analogous translating one language into another. Of course, this map does not preserve the meaning, meanings. Rather, it maps the meanings into each other by an, in a non-trivial manner. So in this case, we have theoretical equivalence, but we have no physical equivalence because, because a high, high temperature is not the same uh, as low temperature. So to summarize, uh, meanings are simply covariate as we map one model to the other without the requirements that the meanings should stay the same. So on this account, there, these are the difference of dualities, like I uh, flashed at the beginning. So duality is isomorphism of models, period, so there's no interpretative requirement for that. Theoretical equivalence, in addition, we require covariance of the interpretations. Physical equivalence is the a uh, stronger notion which requires sameness of interpretations of theoretically equivalent models. So um, what I will have to say about physical equivalence can be summarized in these two slogans, uh, namely a theoretical equivalence that does not invariably lead to physical equivalence, and also physical equivalence is not automatic. 
So once you know that you can map the meanings one to another, it doesn't mean that the meanings stay the same. Okay, so now I'm going to illustrate this uh, in the case of Maxwell's uh, theory, which we've already gone through, but to, to recap... So Sebastian, yep. can you just go back this? Yep. So there are arrows of entailment going up, but not down? Yes. So every... Yeah, every, every notion is stronger than the previous one. Yeah. So, um, Maxwell's theory of electromagnetism, uh, the state space, I mean, the details won't be important really. Uh, basically, the Faraday tensors with, with some uh, standard requirements on them. Quantities are linear maps from the state space to the real numbers. Um, for example, the components of a stress energy tensor, you know, given a, stress, given a Faraday tensor, the stress energy tensor gives you, gives you a, a, a number. So, in that sense, it is a map from the state space to the real numbers. And the dynamics uh, is basically uh, Maxwell's equations over here. Now I, I mean, I'm allowing for the possibility of uh, draft electric sources. OK, so that's the theory. Now I'm going to give models of this, of this theory. Uh, these models are inspired, by the way, are following work by Wetherill, we have, where he has given three uh, similar models, similarly defined. So the first model is the kind of trivial one. It's the Faraday model itself, so it is the same as the theory, but with the state space restricted to be what physicists call on-shell. So remember that here, when I defined the theory, I did not require that the Faraday tensor should, be, should obey the equations of motion. The equations of motion were an, uh, an additional uh, an additional requirement. Now I do. Uh, now I just restrict to those Faraday tensors that actually satisfy the equations of motion. So the representation map from the theory to the model maps off-shell fields and quantities to on-shell ones. So it is not a faithful map, but it, it is it is a homomorphism. It is a, a representation of this theory in, in, in my sense. So it, it is a model. Now a second model is what I will call the gauge field model. Now you know that if we are on R4, then we can always um, kind of integrate this, uh, I mean from this Faraday tensor we can obtain a one form vector potential, what we call vector potential. And so we can reformulate Maxwell's theory in that language. So it gives us the gauge field model where now the state space contains this one form rather than the directly the Faraday tensor. Okay, since uh, a, the gauge field, is part of the specification of the state space of a model. The set of quantities are now, like they were before, the set of maps from the state space to the reals. Uh, so it has in its image polynomials in A and J. So to view this as a representation of the theory, you have to construct a representation map from the state space of the model, namely this, the space of Faraday tensors, to the new uh, sorry, the state space of the theory to the new uh, state space, the, the, the state space of uh, one form. So here is the map, and such a map exists because, of, because we are on R4, so we can always uh, assign a one form potential to a given Faraday tensor. However, this map, as is well known, is not unique, because for any smooth function lambda, the vector potentials A and A prime uh, shifted by this uh, gauge transformation give rise to the same Faraday tensor. So for each smooth lambda there is a different representation map uh, written here such that they correspond to the same Faraday tensor. So now the state space if we take uh, into account these lambdas looks like this. So we take a reference gauge field and then um, for each uh, choice of lambda we get uh, we get a new model. So we have a model that is uh, m lambda i for each set of gauge functions. Okay, now the, notice that the free choice of lambda induces a symmetry on the state space, so it induces a translation along the gauge orbits, which are images of the same value of the Faraday tensor. But in this particular model, we do not define 
equivalence classes for this symmetry. So there's no judgment that gauge fields should be identified under, under, along the gauge orbit. Uh, of course, this is, I mean, physically, this is, this is slightly odd, but I just want to show what are the possibilities for these models. Why is it odd? Well, because it leads to indeterminism. And actually, Gordon Bellot wrote a nice, uh, an interesting paper about that where he interpreted this model not in terms of electromagnetism, but in terms of velocities. And he shows uh, how, how this uh, uh, might lead to, to indeterminism. But, of course, uh, this immediately suggests a third model where we do kind of mod out by this symmetry. Um, so this is what I will call the gauge invariant model, which is the one we would expect if we uh, want to reformulate Maxwell's theory in terms of um, gauge fields. So we take the homomorphism for the state spaces to map the set of gauge to to map to the say, to the sorry to the set of gauge orbits with representative A. So now we identify we take uh, gauge fields along this orbit to be equivalent to each other. So now the states rather than being single gauge fields are entire gauge orbits under this symmetry. So the, the state space is the state space of the previous model modded out by the gauge symmetry or quotiented by the gauge symmetry. Now the quantities of this model are the same as in the Faraday model, but, but written in terms of the gauge field rather than the Faraday tensor. Okay, so let's now discuss whether these three models, the Faraday model, the gauge field model, and the gauge invariant model, whether these are isomorphic or not. So the state space of the Faraday model consists of the Faraday tensors, while that of the gauge invariant model, so the third model that I gave, consists of the gauge orbits. Now, gauge orbits are in one-to-one -one correspondence with Faraday tensors, so these two models are isomorphic because also all the quantities are mapped into each other. That's what we would, what we would uh, expect. On the other hand, M Faraday and the second kind of intermediate model that I offered, those are not isomorphic because the Faraday tensors are not in bijections with gauge fields uh, which, which gauge fields which explicitly depend on the gauge parameter. Namely, there exist multiple homomorphisms, as we saw. So this homomorphism is not invertible, therefore it's not, uh, it's, it's not an isomorphism uh, between the two models. Furthermore, uh, the gauge field model con contains strictly more quantities than, than the gauge invariant models because it, it contains powers of A as quantities as well. So therefore, on, on my account, at least of theoretical equivalence, they cannot be theoretically equivalent because they are not isomorphic. Now, th this illustrates that this notion of representation that I have used as a relation between theory and models is logically weak in the sense that a, a theory has many models, but only some of those models are isomorphic. So the first and third model are isomorphic, but they are not isomorphic to so the second one. So M Faraday and M gauge invariant, they're not even dual, though, right? They, they are, uh, right, they are not, they are not dual. No. So it's stronger than that, they're not theoretically equivalent. Yeah. They're not even yeah. dual. They, indeed. So they, 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 yeah. OK. Um, so now let's focus on the two models that, that are uh, dual. So that's the Faraday model and the gauge environment model. So the question is whether there exists such an induced duality map uh, so that they, they could be theoretically equivalent. So what is the, the interpretation of these models? Now, the interpretation of the Faraday model I already gave, a coordinate free, so the interpretation of the Faraday tensor is a coordinate free specification of an electric and magnetic configuration from a source J. So this interpretation is an intention, like I said before. Now, um, in, in the third model, the gauge invariant uh, model, what is the natural interpretation of a gauge orbit? Well, it is something like a coordinate free specification of a state of light from a source J. That's because um, we think of this gate. We think of this vector potential really in terms of you know we solve a wave equation. It has polarizations. Um, 
and so we can think of those polarizations in classical field theory as as the, as the say the the, uh, the polarization the state of light the two polarizations of a state of light. So with this vector potential, there is naturally a kind of a classical photon that is associated with it. Now, since a gauge orbit uniquely specifies a Faraday tensor and vice versa, the following duality map is, is well defined, where we map an electric and magnetic configuration to a state of light. So we can say everywhere in my, in my model where I have an electric and magnetic configuration, I can replace that by a state of light, and that gives me a well-defined isomorphism because uh, because the uh, there is because Faraday tensors are in one-to-one -one correspondence to gauge orbits. So these two models come out to be theoretically equivalent. But I think in this case we can actually uh, draw a stronger conclusion, namely that the induced duality map is in fact the identity map, so that the models are in fact physically equivalent relative to these particular interpretations. Why? Well, because we, uh, the two interpretations seem to articulate merely different historical perspective on the same phenomenon, namely electric and magnetic phenomena on the side of the Faraday tensor and phenomena of light on the uh, side of the gate invariant model. And what Maxwell's unification precisely showed is that electromagnetic phenomena and light phenomena are, are the same. So I would claim that if we take Maxwell's unification seriously, what we should conclude is that, in fact, an electric and magnetic configuration is the same as a state of light. So in that sense, there is physical equivalence uh, between these two models. Um, so this, on, this, uh, on this understanding, the Faraday model and the Gates environment model are physically equivalent. OK, so now I will go to the second uh, case, second example of electric magnetic duality. So it is well known that Maxwell's equations in vacuum are invariant under this transformation where the electric field goes to the magnetic field and the magnetic field is mapped to minus the electric field. You can summarize this in the language of Faraday tensors by saying that uh, there are two tensors, F and G. G is the Hodge dual of F. Um, the Hodge dual is basically where you dualized by the epsilon tensor, four-dimensional epsilon tensor. And so you map the pair Fg to G comma minus F. Uh, so that's the same as basically mapping electric and magnetic fields into each other. So electric fields are ma mapped into magnetic fields and vice versa, such that the components of the energy momentum tensor are invariant. Also, other covariant and gauge invariant quantities in the model are either strictly invariant, so duality even, or they are duality odd, so they merely change sign under the duality. So the, the two models, uh, EB and E prime, B prime, related by duality can be seen as two representations of a single theory. What is the single theory? Well, it's a theory whose state space, I mean, I'm not going to formulate it in its formal details, but it's a theory whose state space is the set of two forms with an involution. Uh, and you can think, and this involution is a, a complex structure. Um, so the two models correspond, the, so this model and that model correspond basically to two different choices of the complex structure. And one can define these models such that all the states and all the quantities are correctly mapped uh, onto each other under, under the duality. So in that sense, you can say that these models are uh, dual in, in my sense. So this is a case of theoretical equivalence so of two isomorphic models and also uh, of two matching interpretations. Because we simply, for the interpretation, we simply replace everywhere electric with magnetic and other appropriate changes that you might need to do to do that. Um, but again, like in the case of the Kramer-Vanier duality, at least prima, fa prima facie, it's not a case of physical equivalence because electric and mag magnetic phenomena are obviously not the same. So unlike you know, the previous case of, of the Faraday model and the Gate-Imran model, 
here, uh, at least on the usual understanding of electric and magnetic phenomena, they are, they are not obviously the same. So, now notice that the conclusion that electric and magnetic phenomena are distinct actually relies on having defined electric versus magnetic subject matters beforehand, so before the duality is interpreted. So we are assuming that we have possible worlds with well-defined electric or magnetic properties. This is what we call, within previous work I have called an external interpretation, so it's an interpretation that also interprets the structure that is specific to a model, so that electric and magnetic uh, have fixed meanings. Now, such an interpretation, of course, prompted by the scientific practice of measuring electric fields and magnetic fields in different ways. Um, and so these phenomena, these electric and magnetic phenomena, have distinct mani manifestations in our world. And so on an external interpretation, they are, they are distinct. But one might want to see whether there is a possibility to have to be a Leibnizian about electric and magnetic fields here. Um, and not assume that we can always define the subject matter beforehand. If that were the case, then we would be cautious about interpreting the structure of the models as being electric or, or magnetic. Because whether it's electric or magnetic might just be a contextual factor. So we would use the duality between the two models to define the subject matter. So this is the idea, uh, the rough idea of an internal, internal interpretation. It's an interpretation that interprets uh, only the structure that is common, common to the two models. So that the part of the model that is invariant under the duality. And so it takes, the internal interpretation takes the duality to be the starting point for the interpretation. Uh, now on such, on an internal interpretation one may, one may still distinguish between electric and magnetic, but this will be contextual or model relative um, choices, very much like a choice of coordinates or a choice of a standard of rest. So in that sense, the internal interpretation, ex internal in external interpretation do not exclude one another, but they can also complement each other. So an example of this is position versus momentum representations in quantum mechanics related by Fourier transformation. They describe the same system equally well, the same quantum states, even if they do so uh, using different variables. Okay, now let me ask the following question. So, so I have just suggested that I, I want to see whether I'm allowed to be a Leibnizian about electric and magnetic. And I've, I've suggested that one might be able to do that on an internal interpretation. So let me ask, is it physically sensible to say that on an internal interpretation there is no real difference between electric and magnetic fields, as in the Leibnizian view that a world with only electric fields is identical to its appropriately matching world under the duality with only magnetic fields. Now I should admit that I don't have a full answer to this question right now for various reasons. One of the reasons being just purely technical that in order to, I believe, to answer that question you should go to the quantum case. But, um, um, so I, I do think one should be cautious, but even, at, uh, uh, even without going into details about uh, the ontology, um, I will argue that the Leibnizian position is defensible, made based on Maxwell theory itself, and on how we construe what is electric and what is magnetic, according to the theory. Um, so in the next slides, I want to uh, give an argument in favor of the Leibnizian uh, position, according to which electric and magnetic are, dis are distinctions without a difference that should be eliminated on a, on a Leibnizian view. Okay, so the Newton-Clark position that, for example, what is electric and what is magnetic can be decided once and for all is, is not compulsory. Uh, I, I will argue that it is not even well motivated in Maxwell's theory itself. So the, at least as an absolute statement. So the absolute statement that there is kind of a... Um, Can I... Uh, sorry, just a bit. So on the previous yep. slide, you talked about the, um, the worlds being identical. 
I don't mean numerically identical. You mean there's absolutely no other. Di I mean, they're most numerically di different, right? distinct or something. I mean, in the end, if you yeah. So right now, I'm I'm not talking about numerical identity in. So I'm talking about numerical identity in the sense of uh, full. So these inter these domains are sets in the world, and in that sense, they are uh, they are the same set. So the, the, the remember the Van Frassen way of interpreting theories, the picture of the, of the world that these theories that this internal interpretation draws is is the same. That's uh, in, the, in the previous slide I said I wouldn't go into metaphysics, so I believe that to fully answer the question of numerical identity you do have to go into the metaphysics, but I'm not going to do that. So that's why I said, well, I don't have a full account. Uh, what I can give is a plausible argument that the Leibnizian uh, construction is that, that it, it is plausible. Okay, um, all right, I might ask some more. Okay. Okay. So what, on this slide, what I'm arguing is that this uh, absolute, uh, so th this position that you can make an absolute uh, distinction between magnetic and electric once and for all is surely ill-motivated if we accept special relativity. Because in special relativity, whether a force is electric or magnetic depends on, on the frame of reference. So on the standard interpretation of special relativity, uh, we can surely not make a once and for all distinction between electric and magnetic. So consider a point charge moving parallel to a neutral conductive wire. The charge will experience, so you have a wire, which you have a magnetic charge, there will be a magnetic Lorentz force on the charge coming from the wire because uh, this, this charge is moving and the force is proportional to the magnetic field, to the curl of the speed of the velocity of the particle with the magnetic field. Now, let's go and sit on the rest frame of the moving charge. Then, all of a sudden, the charge is at rest. It has no speed. The magnetic force is zero. But uh, there is a non-zero electric force, uh, electric field instead, coming from the wire. So there was no electric field before because the, the, because the wire was uh, electrically neutral. Now, the wire is charged because of the large contraction, so the currents going left and right, they get large contracted in different ways, so you get the net charge on the wire, and that's what causes the electrical force. And this electrical force is the same in magnitude up to the Lorentz factor as the Lorentz force. So in fact, you can derive the Lorentz force from this uh, electrical uh, force in the rest frame of the wire. So what was a magnetic force with zero electric field in one frame is, n is now an electric force on, in the other. So e even if we lived in a world and uh, a frame where we had never seen electric forces but only magnetic forces, we would get an electric force by going to a moving frame relative to the old frame. So the magnetic Lorentz force in one frame is an electric force seen from the other. So it is surely not true on the standard interpretation of special relativity that which phenomena are electric and which are magnetic can be decided a priori once and for all. You, to decide whether something is electric or magnetic, you, you really have to go into the details of the frame you are looking at, and if you change frame, electric and magnetic ma might shift around. Furthermore, one needs to ask, how does a field manifest itself as electric or as magnetic? And the answer is that it depends on how you couple two electric charges. Um, now, we have considered uh, uh, Maxwell's theory in vacuum before. So how do we tell if we leave charges uh, aside for the moment, because charges kind of complicate the story. If we leave charges aside, how do we know whether a field is electric or magnetic if there are no charges? Well, one way to do that would be if we have two kinds of electric and magnetic fields. So two kinds of uh, Faraday tensors. Say one is our target electromagnetic field, which we wish to measure. The other is our reference electromagnetic field, field F tilde. 
which does the measuring. And, and so for this reference field, the difference between electric and magnetic is already made. We have already established what is electric and magnetic for the reference field, and now we are going to use this reference field to establish what, which parts of the target electromagnetic field are electric and which parts are, are magnetic. Now, you can show that the only two derivative gauge invariant covariant couplings between these two fields that we can add to our Lagrangian are as follows. So we can have F with F tilde contracted, but we can also contract them using the epsilon tensor. Um, so you see that the couplings are like B, B tilde minus E, B tilde, and in the other case it's E, B tilde plus B, E tilde. So th those are the two couplings that would allow us to fix whether we are measuring something that is electric or magnetic. So using these couplings we can indeed distinguish electric from, from magnetic because they couple to different parts of F. So this distinction between electric and magnetic makes sense, I mean, uh, can be established once we have fixed the distinction for F tilde. But this is very much like a Galileo ship scenario. We are taking F tilde to be our reference frame, which is, doesn't change. But what happens if we are now Le Leibnizians? So if we are Leibnizians, what we are going to do is, in addition to exchanging F with F tilde, we are also going to exchange uh, F tilde with F tilde dual. Uh, where these terms transform exactly like their F counterparts in the Lagrangian. Um, so in that case, uh, the, the two terms that we find, found, find here, they, they are, this one transforms, this one is invariant, this one transforms merely with a minus sign, like the Lagrangian itself. So this means that in the worlds described by models with these couplings and with appropriate coefficients in front, no difference can be made, neither theoretically, nor through physical interaction. So this is just as the Leibnizian expects. There is a real difference if we limit ourselves to exchanging the electric and magnetic components of the fields we are measuring. But this difference disappears if we also exchange the components of our reference field F tilde, as the Leibnizian claims that we should. Uh, so the field that we use to fix which part of F is electric and which one is magnetic. Okay, so come to the conclusion. So I have given an explication of theoretical equivalence based on the schema for theories and dualities. The schema's account proposes uh, formal interpretive conditions of theoretical equivalence. The formal condition is isomorphism. Uh, the interpretive condition is the requirement that two theoretically equivalent models should have matching interpretations or isomorphic domains of application. Physical equivalence is a stronger requirement than theoretical equivalence, so it's identity of the domain. So these notions can be illustrated by, uh, I have illustrated these notions in the in two examples, in Maxwell's theory and, uh, and also in electric magnetic dual. So that's it, thank you, and I look forward to your questions. I'm going to turn the light back on so we can, make, yeah. I guess, I realize that, the, that we're bidding out in here, so we isn't the light on. Okay, um, I'm going to put it here in case I have to turn the volume off if we get feedback. Yeah. Geneva, do you have some questions you want to ask? Yes, we have questions here. Uh, we're actually, we should move closer to the map. Maybe there is a chance they will hear something if I stay there. You sound, um, you sound bright, very clear today. Okay. Um, uh, so, so thank you very much for trying to uh, defining everything and giving an example. But uh, uh, there seems to me there is a problem with your notion of bare theory. Because uh, sometimes uh, you seem to have some kind of syntactic idea in mind, and sometimes you have you think you think it as a model as a, as a structure. So you, you sometimes talk about 
sentences, you talk about terms, you talk about so interpreting those. And, but your official definition is, uh, I mean, your main example is a triple of a set of mathematical structures. But then you come back and you say uh, the interpretation, you talk of referential semantics, and you talk about the, the reference of the terms. But it's not clear to me that in your example that what, what the terms are. Thank you. Okay, thanks for that. So, um, so my, um, my notion of theory, uh, I follow actually the recent literature in using a combination of semantic and syntactic views. So there's, a, there's been a recent discussion in the literature uh, arguing that basically uh, you always use elements of both the syntactic and the semantic view. So on the semantic view, of course, a theory is just a set of models. Uh, and my view of theory is inspired by that. But it is not just that, because a set of models is, in a way, it's a very naive way of looking at the theory, I, I, I believe. I mean, it's, I think it's not enough to define a theory as a set of models. So I have defined a theory, I have defined models uh, in, in a slightly different way than, it, than it's normally done in that definition. So I have this theory in addition to uh, the models. Um, and then I do have a linguistic element in that the theory itself is not just an abstract calculus. So the theory itself has a syntactic component already built in, in that you have, you can have sentences of kind of mathematical physics text that are produced by this theory. And these sentences are still uninterpreted. And so what the interpretation does, does is it maps these sentences to the world. So you're perfectly right that I'm using a combination of syntactic and semantic elements, but that's, I'm aware of that, and that's part of, of our framework, yes. OK. Uh, so I'm not sure how the syntactic part would would work out in your example because I don't think you have specified exactly how the how the, the the theory the linguistic part is supposed to work and I can imagine say a, a theory that describes the sort of structure you're talking about but it seems to me that this is already interpreted and as a, just a mathematical interpretation right. so it's not clear. What is this uninterpreted calculus? And yeah. That, yeah, so that's an interesting point. Uh, I mean, I, indeed, I haven't you know, detailed that because it, it, it would be, I mean, it would make the schema overly complicated. But you are right that there is a two-step interpretation. The first interpretation is um, a mathematical physics interpretation. We, uh, and the second step is the interpretation to the world. So, so what I call what I call a bare theory, for example, Hudetz calls it a pre-interpreted theory. So there is some element of interpretation there already, even if I haven't specified whether I'm talking about electromagnetic fields or whether I'm talking about money on a bank on a on a bank account. So I could still be using Faraday tensors to talk about money on a bank account, but I, but by talking about Faraday tensors and how they appear in my theory, I'm I already have this. Uh, kind of pre-interpretation, if you will. This is something that I've mentioned in the paper, but I'm, I'm kind of glossing over it here. But that, that's perfectly right, yeah. OK. Uh, thank you. Uh, OK, I have a question, but once I've done with the question, maybe you can switch off the microphone, because otherwise they get back backwards. Um, so thank you very much for a very clear presentation. Um, I'm thinking, of course, of applying this scheme to other cases of interest. And for instance, something like the ADF CFT duality, or like the Schrodinger wave mechanics and Heisenberg uh, matrix theory, things like this, where the rich philosophers of physics really are interested to figure out what exactly is the relationship between the potentially dual uh, objects. But then, I'm not sure I even get out of the starting block because you define uh, uh, duality as an isomorphism between models of one and the same theory. So it, 
Now I don't know whether I'm looking at the, the, the ATS model or theory at the CTX, CFT uh, theory, presumably. Uh, uh, I cannot presuppose already that these are models of the same theory. This is an open question. They're prima facie distinct theories. And I want to find out whether they're theoretically equivalent or dual in the first place. So why do you restrict uh, the definition already uh, at the beginning to those being models of the same theory? Yeah, I think that, that's an excellent question that we've also thought about. Uh, can I turn off the mic? Um, so, the, I mean, the answer, I think, is that um, it is, I mean, it, it is a widespread view when thinking about theories and models. Oh, Just keep that over. That there should always be some kind of, um, you know, system of axioms or uh, some structure underlying uh, these different models. So I think, especially in, in cases of physics, even though it looks like a, a heavy kind of exti existence claim, I think in fact it, it is a very mild one, in the sense that once you have established, I think establishing the isomorphism is already uh, is, is pretty much the same as uh, establishing this theory, in the sense that you could always you know, take these two models and look at the invariant part of these two models and that will be your bare theory. So basically uh, quotienting the two models by the duality will produce the bare theory. Uh, that, that's, I mean, you know, um, at least in all the examples that I have seen, you, you, can, you can do that. Now in the case of ADS-CFT, um, it seems that there is also some structure like, like that. So it basically, uh, the, at least at the semi-classical level, uh, so I should say that ADS-CFT of course is not proven yet. It is not proven to be a duality, so we don't really know what is the isomorphism. But we do know the semi-classical case. So in the semi-classical limit, uh, the ADS space, all of its degrees of freedom turn out to be, uh, in a way, so, so the Hilbert space is, is living on the boundary of the ADS. So you can, um, you can think of the state space and set of quantities and the dynamics of the uh, ADS theory as being basically um, obtained from the algebra of observables at infinity. So at infinity there is a conformal algebra that people have worked out uh, and then that, from that algebra you can, you can look for the representations of that algebra, construct the quantities and construct the Hilbert spray space from the algebra. Uh, and, and on that view, the ADS side and the CFT side seem to pretty much be just two different, two, represent, two, two equivalent representations uh, of the algebra. It works out also in this case, in, also in this way in other cases. For example, another case that we have looked at in very much detail is bosonization, where you can actually prove that there is an isomorphism. So in that case, it turns out that you can, the whole duality comes down to just uh, the uniqueness of the representations, of the unitary representations of a certain type of infinite dimensional Lie algebra, of which the bosons and the fermions are two different representations. So in those cases, at least in these cases that are kind of, you know, Hilbert space based, it seems that obtaining the Hilbert space is already giving you the theory. So obtaining the algebra of observables from which you construct the Hilbert space, that is already like giving the underlying theory. Uh, now the case of you were mentioning, I think, matrix mechanics um, versus Schr Schrodinger mechanics. Oh, sorry. We we lost the microphone here. Um, how are you thinking about it? But it seems to me there's still a sense in which it's sort of putting 
the cart before the horse in sort of the wrong direction. The way you define it is you start out from a bare theory, then you get two models from that, and then you see whether it's you know there's an isomorphism. But in fact, what you're doing is you have two mathematical structures in the beginning and you try to see whether there is an isomorphism. If you find one, then you think like, ah, now I've shown that there really are models of uh, uh, the invariant uh, core, you know, the, the bare theory, and therefore, you know, but, but that's sort of a result. That's not the starting point, as it were. You know what I mean? Yes. Why do you leave that line? Okay. You guys can hate all yeah. my... I mean, I think one, one should make a distinction of between the formal construction and how physicists in practice come to find out whether something is a duality. So you're, you're completely right that in practice we have two theories and then we find half. They are isomorphic. And at that point we don't know anything about the existence of this, of this theory of which we are representations. I, um, so what, what I'm saying is that on my definition Coming to f find out that these theories are dual also includes this extra step of showing that they are representations of the same theory. Now what I'm also arguing is that that is actually a very mild step because once you have an isomorphism, you always, when you have isomorphism, you always have to specify the structure with respect to this an isomorphism. What I'm kind of saying is that this structure that underlies the isomorphism is what I call the bare theory. And so, um, the um, um, so I'm giving. You're right that I'm giving a slightly stronger requirement than we would do if we would just say, well, these are isomorphic. But I think it also makes it more precise because it forces us to think about what is the uh, bare, what is the structure that is underlying this isomorphism. Um, I should say that the existence of this underlying theory is, is logically weak also in this sense that the, the bare theory is not unique. So once you have found this isomorphism and you have identified what is the common structure, that is, that is uh, your theory, uh, and it is, um, then you might, you, you are always, almost always able to find more general theories of which these two dual models are also uh, representations. So this bare theory needs not be unique. Uh, so I think its existence is, is, is a pretty mild requirement and I think it conceptually clarifies what we are doing when we say that two things are dual, but, uh, but it needs not be unique. Can I, can yeah, I thank you, that's helpful. Well, I have a finger on this, which is, so physicists classify self-dual theories as a special kind of dual theory. So how does that, so I thought I understood what that distinction means. How do you make the, draw that distinction in your framework? Yeah, so self-dual theories would be basically cases of, of symmetry where, uh, you, where you have, where the state spaces are the same. So rather than having two appear different spaces, you have one single space and, and the duality moves you along that space. So it's an automorphism of a single uh, space. Okay, right, okay. So same represent, it's not that it, you're, I always thought of self-dual as meaning a duality between sort of instantiations of the same theory or something like that, but really it's. The duality, yeah, the duality map is really the identity. The same representations of yeah, the same theory exactly, for you. Exactly. Yeah, it's, exactly, it's precisely the duality, the un, un, unity, the unit map. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Do you have some more questions there in Geneva? I don't actually see any more people, but maybe Niels is there. Okay. Any questions here? Well, I have questions then. Um, and where do I want to start? Oh, okay, so this came out of a discussion I had with um, um, Ben Feinzig, who's one of you know, Wetherill's students, and sort of a, another name that might have appeared up in some of the things you were talking about there. Um, based on 
a comment, I guess actually that Tom Barrett made at, the, at that session at the PSA. We had a, we had a whole session of, of, mm -hmm. on these things at the PSA. And I take it some of the things that I, I could see you were in a way responding to things that were said there here, mm -hmm. elaborating things you said. But he mentioned, um, right, so, um, that they had shown categorical equivalence of the sort of Einstein algebras and general relativity. Um, is that going to come out to um, duality as well? Categorical equivalence. Actually, the technical question is not the one I had. I, I, I kind of wanted to try to reconstruct how, the, how this discussion went. So let's suppose that mm. there's an isomorphism between the models as well. So this is a duality. Mm. Um, and I sort of think I can see how that would, would, would go um, in terms of you know, manifolds on one side and algebra on the other side. Mm. But I can reconstruct you know, the algebra is the algebra of fields. And, the points of the um, maximal ideals of the, the algebra. Mm -hmm. So I'm assuming one would think about trying to construct an isomorphism that way. Mm -hmm. um, do you think, so if, that, if things went, do you understand what I mean by that sort of yeah, picture? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that also going to give me theoretical equivalence? I mean, I think it's plausible that it would give it, but I don't think it's automatic because theoretical equivalence really depends on the kind of interpretation that you look at. Uh, so you would have to actually construct an interpretation of these algebras and uh, see whether it's the same, and whether the, the interpretations map, match. Um, so I think once you have an isomorphism, I think it's very plausible that you will be able to find you know, reasonable interpretations that are empirically adequate and so on that are that are matching, but it's, I think it's not guaranteed. Um, I haven't looked at the details of of of, of that example, but it, it seems plausible that it would. We, I, I mean, I, I did have a discussion with Thomas Barrett after the PSA actually, and um, and, and with, with Jim. So one point, I mean, but this is really about the de some of the details of, you know, the isomorphism account versus what they call the more liberal accounts. Um, I mean, I'm not going to say much about that uh, right now. It's a long story, but yeah, fair enough. It, it, um, I'm happy to discuss it later. But basically, uh, isomorphism really depends on what is the structure that you take. So you have to be precise about what is the structure with respect to which these models are isomorphic. And without doing that, the isomorphism account, th there is no isomorphism account without specifying that. Um, and so sometimes the isomorphism account is charged to be too, uh, well, too strict in the sense that it doesn't, it, it, it maps, it, it doesn't uh, map models that we would we might want to uh, say are isomorphic uh, but sometimes there are reasons for that so this so sometimes there are good reasons why you don't want certain models to be isomorphic so on my view some of the liberal models are are too liberal in that they put they are too loose at the formal level so that once you if you construct internal interpretations then the internal interpretations basically do, much, do too much work for them, but yeah, uh, we can, can discuss that. Because it's seems, yeah, so maybe we need to unpack it a bit. So, but if you push the line, so suppose there is a line in which the interpretations st start to look like they're coming out the same, um, it seems like you know, if these are really both supposed to be theories uh, of sort of gravitational phenomena, then as I understand it, when you start saying what the intentions are and you start talking about the pre-understood things that are out in the world to do with 
observations of inertial motion or you know planetary effects or some you know there's a case that is that that, it, that sort of if that's the way you're right going to flesh out the interpretation that they're going to come out also mm -hmm. to be sort of um, theoretically equivalent under that yeah. sort of minimal interpretation yeah. but it still seems to me and this you know was maybe what Chris also sort of had in mind with ADS CFT you know yeah. oh no no they're really different kind of theories um, so I think I would then sort of say but look what really distinguishes them so in one the algebraic you know the Einstein algebras look the algebra that's the fundamental thing and yeah there's manifolds and fields and I'm going to interpret the theory through those, but those are derived notions in that theory. On the contrary, in the sort of GR, um, right, the, the manifold, the fields, those are the basic things. And yeah, there's an algebraic structure, but that's sort of derived from the, the more fundamental um, so yeah. fields that I have. Do you think some so that okay so then the key notion is sort of that I wanted to, the extra notion that I'm sort of putting in there is derived and fundamental yeah. um, and you know Ben's response was well yeah look but then I you know in the category theory approach I would just build those into as extra predicates in my models and now they wouldn't be categorically equivalent anymore because I'm, anyway yeah. but in your case I'm just sort of thinking how the same move would go would you just say yeah yeah but now you're talking could the derived fundamental distinction be built into the sort of theoretical equivalence question, or would that be a metaphysical question that would come into the physical equivalence? Yeah, a very good question. So, so actually, the version of the schema I have presented was slightly simplified. I didn't talk about what we call model root and specific structure. So, I I said well we have these models which are triples, um, and they may be isomorphic, and so we make a distinction between what we call the model root and the specific structure. The model root is basically the part of the model that is isomorphic under this duality. The specific structure is other structure that is also part of the model, but that is kind of in there just to build up the model. Like when you, for example, have you know uh, representations of a group, you can have uh, you have a, an abstract group, and then you can have representations of different dimen dimensions with different, and you can have, um, so the choice of basis, for example, for to construct your representation, it would be a specific structure. It's stuff that is in your model, but you just use it to build the model. But actually, when you map two, re two dual re representations, the choice of basis doesn't really play a role. One, one basis is, is mapped into the other. So there is stuff that is not invariant under this uh, isomorphism, but which you nevertheless use in order to show that these are equivalent representations. So the way I actually define internal representations is that they are the representations that interpret only the model root and not the specific structure. So in that, in that sense, you, can, you could say that there is some kind of yeah, fundamental versus, um, versus derived Distinction, at least at the le at the heuristic level of model buildings, things like that, uh, where yes, you would interpret the model root as kind of more fundamental than the specific structure, because after all, you can use different specific structure to build different models. Um, yeah, so that's how I mean. So then they might come out to be dual but not theoretically equivalent, is that right? No, they would still be theoretically equivalent because then, uh, at least on, yeah, on, an inter on an internal okay. interpretation, the internal interpretation kind of forgets about the specific structure. So it's, it's, it's the interpretation that only interprets the things that are invariant. And all the other things are, you could call them contextual or you know, choices uh, that are made. I see. So that would be going to bring that in. That just sort of to bring fundamental and derived it would be to bring in some metaphysics or something here. Yeah, exactly. Or maybe in a exactly. kind of mild way. That yeah, exactly. So because, I mean, in the end, you know, I, I'm not committed to the view that we should be like Nietzscheans. I mean, uh, that that these two models should, if they are 
I'm not going to the view, like, like I, I said, that if two worlds are dual, that necessarily they must be physically equivalent. So there could be, I could imagine situations like Primer's one year's uh, model where these are actually distinct models, and we want to say so, we want to say that they are, they are theoretically and physically, sorry, they are theoretically equivalent, but physically inequivalent. So, yeah, calling this fundamental and, and derived is, is making an implicit choice of having an internal interpretation. Or yeah, bringing in some interpretative requirement into it. Okay. In fact, one of the things that happened, uh, and I was talking about, um, I think this relates to model building theory, uh, theory construction. So one one so physicists have two different ways of often of interpreting these dualities. One is to say, yeah, these are really the same model, and so we interpret them ontologically as. As, as being about the same subject matter. But often they are also interested in dualities for a different reason, namely that this specific structure is something that they are going to build to kind of build a new theory which uh, is more general. And this new theory, for example, this is the case in, in the M-theory program, right? So we think that T duality between type 2 A string theory and type 2 B string theory uh, is, is an exact duality of the perturbative string theories, but it's not clear that it's a duality of M theory. So, um, so, the, uh, so the, the specific structure might sometimes be used to build a kind of bigger theory of which these duals are just approximations. I might ask one more quick one. <coughs> That's okay. So you you addressed you thought of your clock saying that there was an absolute distinction between electrical and magnetic fields, right? Couldn't but couldn't we make the work? But make the, and I, and I, I sort of saw the arguments why you thought that was sort of implausible, um, right? Because of the sort of relativistic the relativity of the, that distinction. But wouldn't it be enough to have made a distinction between magnetic monopoles and charges? And they're not framed, that distinction isn't frame dependent, as I understand it. Wouldn't that be enough to sort of, I mean then, okay, here's the charge and I see what it does. Oh, that's an electric field and I see what that does. It's a magnetic field. I don't totally understand the duality, but yeah. would that not give us a way, give us a handle? And then, yeah. I mean, if you bring in electrons and monopoles, then I think, Technically, at least, the, the discussion is a bit complicates a bit, so that's why I avoided that kind of language. But I think, I think in the end, if you look at n equals four super Young Mills theory, for example, where this duality is exact, including you know the charged particles, I think there is a similar case to be made that you can then have a, at least in worlds that are described purely by the n equals four super Young Mills theory that you couldn't tell the difference between uh, an electric uh, charge and a magnetic monopole in that kind of theory. I think that there, there is uh, okay. a case to be made in that yeah. case as well. Okay. But that requires much more analysis than I've been able to do here. Okay. My computer is threatening to um, run out of battery and die, so unless there's a burning question from Geneva, maybe we should... Uh, Call it a day. No, I think it's okay. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Sebastian. That was thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Bye. We'll see you in a couple of weeks, right? You have a talk coming in or something. So. Yes. Bye. Bye. Yeah. And let me uh, also. That went great. That was really good. Okay. Have well, you been questions. here before? No. Oh, hey. One more. Are you a physicist? Yeah. A grad student? Yeah. Oh, cool. Cool. Nice to see you. Uh, did Narendra tell you about this? Or? Uh, no, I just saw it in the like, uh, TV screen. Okay. okay. Yeah. Cool. Uh, okay. Cool. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks for coming. <laughs> so keep an eye out because we also have talks coming from Geneva. Right. And then.
like uh, Geneva is uh, uh, was in the yeah they were, they were in Geneva. So. Oh, these oh, it's, you're talking about the place. I, was, I thought you, uh, Geneva was a person. <laughs> no, 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 no. The place, <laughs> okay. right? So if you look on our, our website, is beyond space time. Okay. So you can see all the talks there. They should get advertised in physics also. Okay. But yeah. And what's the website? Um, beyondspacetime.net or one word. You can see talks there. So yeah, bring people. Yeah, people come over for physics. Cool. Are you taking the quantum class? Yeah. Okay. So you're my student, uh, Narendra. Oh, right, right. oh, right, right, right. She's yeah, not here yeah. today. But yeah, she's uh, yeah, she's the uh, one philosophy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So she usually is here for these as well. So. Okay. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm like. Uh, this is my first like uh, philosophy in physics talk, so mm -hmm. it's cool to see like, <laughs> uh, yeah. like how like you know. How yeah, take a okay, good. Take a look at the website, and you'll see there's a bunch. You know, there's all kinds of different. I mean, it's all this. It's all. Well, it wasn't too obvious here, but it's a quantum gravity and issues in quantum gravity. Okay. That's where duality is a big thing. There is sort of the theme, but there's all kinds of things. Cool.